is having an unbelievable uh, day. Uh, as you can see, it's rainy and uh, muggy and everything. Uh, just really damp outside here. But to be alive, to be breathing is a blessing. So things like this are just what it is to me. I love it when the sun is out, but I definitely have come to appreciate the rain. Um, before I get started, uh, I want to remind you guys that we are in need of your support. Uh, we have been doing work in the community now for decades, literally. It's crazy when I say that. Um, one part of me knows I'm 55. The other part of me still wants to believe I'm 30. But I've been doing this stuff for 30 plus years, 35 years and some change. Uh, I've been on this journey for even longer, reading and studying all the way back to the 11th grade when I discovered Frances Cress Wilson uh, defending her Cress theory of color confrontation on Phil Donahue, uh, the Donahue show, 1985. And I haven't looked back since as far as psychology is concerned. Uh, I've made some major breakthroughs and discoveries, created some things, developed some uh, hypotheses and theories along the way, and have done a great deal to help a lot of people because she inspired me. Uh, the Odyssey Project has a research form that is result of that. It has a think tank that's the result of that. It has programs developed by yours truly like Black Men Lead, Music is Life, uh, the Black Empowered, Empowered Empowerment Initiative, and many more. We have wraparound services for mental health, uh, domestic violence, and more. Uh, we help young black males who are caught up in the system and are being mishandled and so much more. Uh, I have advocated for young uh, children, uh, predominantly young black males who have been disproportionately uh, referred to special education uh, designations uh, and so much more. Uh, every day there's something that's coming into my email uh, box and landing on my desk of people in the community that need our services. And I consistently go all in and I, you know, I have a life, I live a life, I run a life, I mean, I run a, a, a business. Uh, so I do everything I can to make this happen. Uh, and I have for officially nearly 20 years officially with this particular organization. Basically funded it. I've had some help from my partner and my ace and my co-host, uh, Dr. Michael Blanchard. He's been consistent. There have been some other people who have given along the way. Uh, but when you count what it takes, just think about what I just named and think about how much that might cost. And think about the fact that I'm still waiting to hit the $20,000 mark in 20 years of donations. And it lets you know how we are as a people. Now, we flood the non-industrial uh I mean, we flood the nonprofit industrial complex. They show up, they have a lot of money, they push things, they give you the exposure, they make it shiny, they make it flashy, they make it sound good. Black Lives Matter raped the hell out of us. And we gave like it was crazy. We walked around with their signs. We didn't just give, we promoted it. We blew it up. We made it bigger than it initially was. The whole time, uh, people like Darren Seals, Neota Ura, uh, which were feeding me information and I'm yelling from the top of my lungs. This isn't what y'all think it is. They are literally disrupting a social movement. They are literally pulling the linchpins from this social movement and it's going to fall apart because they are there for that purpose. And then we financed it. This is what I was talking about in an early video. When we have a tendency to finance our own demise and then underfund our progression, that's a problem. So again, I'm sitting up and I'm saying we need to do better. So I am challenging anyone who believes, and here's my thing. I don't know about you, but my time is valuable. 
outside of my mind, my time is my most valuable asset. And where I invested, how I invested matters. And I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of my time anywhere where there isn't something that I see value in. So I'm assuming if you're consistently here and you're following me, you see the value. So I'm asking you now that I need that value to be reflected in support. I understand everybody's got some things going on, but to sit here and, and, and my pride for years has let me just sit up and every now and then pop out there and say, hey, we need your help. Then get upset because I don't get the help and then go back to doing what I've always done. I'm not going to back off. If you don't give, you don't give, but I'm not going to back off and I'm not going to feel bad for asking for help. I've been going hard in the paint for 30 plus years. And like I said, in 20 years, 20, less than $20,000, I think we might be at 15, last time I checked. Every night that somebody stops in and, and blesses us, uh, we had one real nice, generous donation a couple of years ago, a couple of thousand. Other than that, Dr. Blanchett has helped them along the way. And the rest of it is, guess who? So yeah, I think I have uh, the right to sit up and say, hey, look, I need your help. Whether you give it or not, it's absolutely 100% up to you. Nobody owes me anything. But I believe when I'm giving to something other than myself and I'm doing it 100%, I have a right to ask. So I'm asking, show some love, show some support. Uh, the way that you can give is in the description box. You can either go in, click the link, and give that way, or you can give through the organization's cash app handle. Uh, you determine what way works best for you. Now, moving on. Obviously, this morning I stopped in and I talked to you about the senseless killing of takeoff one of the Migos in Houston, here in Houston, which definitely doesn't make it better. And there are a lot of things going on that obviously I'm not going to talk about because uh, of who's involved. I'm going to wait to see how this plays out. But what I can tell you is this is a microcosm of a much bigger issue that I have been trumpeting my God for almost 20 years now. Some years ago, I decided I wanted to address the African-American adolescent and young adult male violence issue. I also wanted to effectively challenge the black on black crime narrative uh, and my result was the discovery of just how powerful socialization is in the development of black boys now anyone who studies psychology or sociology understands socialization as a tool for developing children it is vital but racial socialization for black kids is immensely important and it has a seemingly even more intensive impact on black boys because black boys are targeted earlier in life than black women. Black women catch the back end of things because of our failure to black boys. Black boys are targeted as early as four or five years old in the educational system, uh, in, in negligence in the home, in poor home culture, in poor socialization and development. And, and leaving them with a poor sense of identity. Now, in, this, in, 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 in gaining an understanding of that, I also gained an understanding of how this narrative of black on black crime is used. And, and the reason I call it a myth, myth people say, you, you're telling me black people aren't killing black people? Absolutely. But I can tell you that 84% of all white homicides are, are committed by a white person we tend to commit acts of violence which tend to be emotionally charged events around people we know. So if you're in an enclave, if you're in a group, you're gonna normally have violent outbursts, fights, stabbings and shootings and everything in between around people you know. So the chances are you're gonna be assaulted by somebody from your own race group, unless there are some you know, distinct and insinuating circumstances. But as a rule, a large portion of homicides and violence are going to be committed 
by the people who look like you. Now, granted, ours is higher than 84%, but that can be also directly linked to the poverty influence. Poverty increases violence. It simply does. That's, again, sociology 101. The reason I call it a myth is it's never discussed outside of the spectrum of black violence. Uh, we're not going to look at Asian on Asian violence, white on white violence, Latino on Latino violence. All of that exists at a very high rate in groups because it's proximal. But we don't ever hear any of that. Why? Because we want the narrative to sound like there's some unique, dis distinct and inherent uh, violent nature among black males. Thus, the natural fear of white police officers when dealing with a black male. There's something inherently violent and supernaturally strong about a black male. They are built to kill. This is an image that's being perpetuated on, alongside an image of an uncontrollable, emotionally charged, emotionally unstable black male. And so what we are looking at is we're having a deck stacked against us in a way that you can't possibly imagine. And we're expecting our young black males to be able to navigate this, not only navigate it, but then perform at a level that's acceptable to the group so that they can be received by the group and praised by the group. The problem is they haven't been prepared by the group. Now, I told you when I wrote my 16th book, I had told you years before that through lectures and speeches and articles and a bunch of other things. But in The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, I think 2014, I told you that um, um, education isn't simply the acquisition of academic skills it was the holistic preparation and empowerment of our youth to be able to go out as adults and not only compete in a world that's inherently hostile towards them but win and what we have is a situation in which we aren't preparing them we aren't preparing them. We aren't social. When you socialize the child, every child is socialized. That's how they go out and they're pro social and they're productive. You tell them what they're not supposed to do, what they are supposed to do. You let them know who they are. You're smart. You're beautiful. You're handsome. Uh, all the things that are going to give them a positive self image, build strong self esteem, strong self confidence. But when it comes to blacks, there has to be a second level of socialization we call racial socialization. What is that? That is the introduction into the notion that because you're black, you're going to hear this, you're going to see this, you're going to experience this, they're going to say this, and what you're doing is inoculating them against all of the things that people are going to do, say, and push upon them that is in diametric opposition to what you just socialized them into. That you're beautiful, that you're smart, that you're capable, that you have everything necessary to, to be exceptionally uh, phenomenal in this world. They're going to get out there and tell you you're not beautiful, that you're inherently violent, that you have a bench towards this, that you are, uh, poverty is your lot in life, that, you know, all these different, that you're not classy, that something's wrong with your hair. All these different things are being pushed upon them. So what do we have to do? We have to racially socialize them to expect this, but in inculcate into their psyches at a very deep level who they are and how exceptional they are and that there's value in being who they are, that they don't have to aspire to be anything other than who they are because that in itself is phenomenal. That's what racial socialization is. We don't have that for boys. Every other group has a rite of passage where young boys in that group determine, uh, uh, you know, learn and determine who they are and develop an understanding of what their responsibility and their role is within that racial enclave. We, on the other hand, have a bunch of individualism, a bunch of competition, a bunch of see me, see me. What do I do to be seen? And what do I do to get some, some form of quasi respect? I can't get true respect because I don't have the things that people are respecting. So I'll demand it through fear. And fear begets fear. Fear begets violence. Violence begets violence. And here we are. 
But I learned that properly socializing young black males reduces their proclivity to violence, reduces their uh, alienation in schools, which reduces their dropout rate, which reduces the rate of incarceration. Uh, it also reduces uh, intimate partner violence and it increases the possibility and chance of business ownership. These are things that I've been able to prove in my own research and in practical application through me actually operating the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage program. The problem is we think things are gonna fix themselves, that we don't have to be invested, that we don't have to take part, that we don't have to own it, as long as my home is okay. But the problem is you can raise your kids and you can do everything that you can and they can be in the wrong place at the wrong time where a kid that didn't get exposed to it, that didn't get the chance they got, ends their life. Even if it's not intentional, because from what I understand about this whole takeoff thing is he wasn't even playing the dice game. He just happened to be in there and it popped off. And I'm not gonna call all the you know stuff because I don't know how true it is, but from what I understand, he wasn't actually in the argument. He just got shot. And from what I understand, he got shot by his own dude. Now, when they returned fire, from what I understand, he got hit again. And so that is what I'm trying to get you to understand is that we absolutely have to do a better job of owning our responsibility in all of this. And so once again, I'm gonna challenge you, show some love, show some support support the work I do. We have so far to go. I'm going to close out on this note. Um, something I've been saying for probably 20 years, uh, and I'll say it until I'm gone and hopefully it'll catch on. I'm definitely doing the best I can in this area. But I, I, I have said and consistently say that the only way to true black empowerment is to find men who are willing to plant seeds that they may not live long enough to see come to fruition. Our desire to get immediate gratification, a pat on the back, acknowledgement, our name on something, constantly pushes us towards band-aid resolutions, uh, quick fixes, things that shine quickly but don't have longevity or foundation and they look good, but they don't work. And then we get a bunch of funding by them. We might build our name up and people will say, look what they're doing. And we look at it and we say, well, if we're winning and if we're doing that good, why are we going backwards? It's because we're not planting seeds. We're not planting them deep enough. We're not cultivating them. We're not sitting up and putting time into strengthening uh, the core of what we say is our future. And that's our youth. We've got to do a better job of that. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, it's been one of those days. So I'm going to get out, get in here, relax. But I'm challenging you. If you believe in what I'm doing, if you think what I'm doing has merit, it, you know, and like I said, I didn't just show up here. You guys have known about me for years. I've been on YouTube since 2010. Facebook through since 2010, Twitter since 2010, Instagram 2011, and I was working 20 years before that. This isn't new to me. This is my love. This is my passion. My heart breaks every time a young black male dies or a young black male takes a life, throws his life away with it, and goes to prison. I've got kids I'm working with that are on the inside. I got kids that I'm working with who are having suicidal ideations. I've got kids I'm working with that are struggling with depression. I've got kids I'm working with whose parents believe that this is the last chance for them. And everybody's just acting like it's okay. And they are being bombarded with ideas and images of their inferiority and their natural proclivity for violence. And there's very little to oppose it, to counter it, to refute it. That's our responsibility. You can stand with me or not. You can support me or not. But I'm telling you, I'm going to go all in until there's nothing left. Somebody has to do it. And I'm not saying I'm the only one, because I'm not. I got brothers I know that are out there 
doing it just like I'm doing it, but they having the same frustrations. It's not shiny enough. It doesn't have enough. The thing is, you got to have money to get money. You got to have money behind you, making you look big, putting all the... I'm not here for the song and dance. I'm out there, boots on the ground. I'm the one putting in the research. I'm the one that's sitting up. And Dr. Blanchard has said for, man, 2000, since 2012, he said, unfortunately, Doc, I don't think they're going to know who you are until you're gone. I don't think they're going to develop an appreciation of you until you're gone. And you know what I told him? I'm good with that. I'm 100% good with that. I'm writing a legacy. I don't need the pats on the back. My ego is good. I don't need anybody to stroke it. I don't need anybody to tell me who I am. I've been working on who I am my entire life. I know who I am. Now, what I could use are some people who want to walk this thing with me in your lane. Uh, some people are want to be boots on the ground. Other people are not, you know, that's not your thing. But everybody can show some love some kind of way. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, get in here, do my own little version of unwinding, and then I'm going to uh, catch up with you guys a little later. You guys take care, and I'm out of here.